So I have a selection of maples that have already been put in pots and I'm just going to show you what I'm going to do with each of these. Let's look at each of them in turn. Now this one I put in pots in the greenhouse because I want to resuscitate it and make new growth. It was growing a bit too tall so I cut the top off. When I cut the top off I always leave a stub in case it dies back further but I know that it won't go back any further now. So this one I think is one of the Yatsabusa, very small leaf ones because the internodes are very small. So this one, if we come close, you see that there's one tall shoot there. That can become the new leader. So that being in the center would be a very nice, useful leader. So the question is, should I cut it or not? I can easily cut it there and make a nice rounded small tree. But if I want to make this leader thicker, I will just let that grow unchecked. Also, while I'm looking at this tree, this dead piece, it's not serving any useful purpose. So let me bring a saw and cut some of that off. Is the saw here? Right? Oh. So you must be wondering why I'm cutting it now. I'm doing it now because during the growing season it will get a chance to callus and it will heal properly and I will therefore get a nice callusing effect and I don't want to waste the coming year so I'm cutting it. If I leave it, it won't callus. The, the dead piece will eventually fall off but I can assist it by cutting it. Something as thick as this, which is about three quarter inch thick. I prefer to use a saw rather than nibble away with a branch cutter. You can do it either way. And then once you've done that, you can then use a branch cutter, root cutter, or whatever to, to refine it. So let me just see what tool I have handy. So I can't find my branch cutter, but I got a root cutter. That'll do the trick. So it's just to pair it till I get to the green part, which is the live bit. And then once it heals over, it'll blend in with the rest of the tree and I will get a very good taper. All these trees, by the way, I actually grown on the nursery. If you've been around my growing fields, we literally have thousands of maples in all different stages of development. So that gives you a nice taper that way. So I will still have more training to do. I can, if I want to wire these out a little bit. Uh, I will also show you that I will put some cut paste on it just to help it to callus. There's a lot of controversy about whether cut paste has any effect. Some people believe that you don't have to put any paste, but I think from experience the cut paste does hasten the process. So this is the Japanese cut paste. There are many different types of cut paste. So I won't do more than that to this tree. I will just leave it to grow on. Let's look at the next one. Now this is another one. You see, we are very fond of growing these stumpy little trees to make them what we call small or shohin bonsai. So that leader, potential leader there died. So that's not doing anything. 
because these trees are quite old, the wood is quite hard. I may just let this die over a period of time and not rush it. The only trouble with cutting too close to live bits of wood is that it can cause dieback on the live branches. So sometimes it's, you know, better to just leave it alone. So this is another candidate for a dwarf or a shohin tree. This is growing inward, so I don't want that. So I will probably just let this rot in this case. And when it rots, it'll form a nice uh, natural callus. You see how this has callus there? You get that effect. So this tree, if I wanted to make a shohin, I could make it make this the leader and wire these out. Now this one, I probably won't let these grow ad infinitum because I may lose control. I may just keep the central one and I will just prune these bits off. Maybe even prune this and just let it grow into a broom style. So the branch development is more even. So that is how this is going to progress. Now let's look at another one. These are all the same style trees that we are developing. Stumpy short trees, not too tall. Invariably you find some dieback, but that's not a problem. I can always get new leaders to grow. See, once you come into a live wood, you see the green there. So, where the dead bits I take out. So this is how we keep producing taper. And that will take over and become the new shoot. With maples, you always get little twigs that die back. Don't worry about that. That is typical of maples, so in the spring you will get some shoots which are dead because the winter is quite hard. By the way, smaller maples I do protect a little bit. The larger ones I leave outside to stand in the cold. So this one, because it's a fine leaf tree and fine twigs, I'm going to just give it a shear all around to make it produce new shoots because I want to stimulate growth here. That's why I'm pruning this. If I didn't prune it, it will keep growing long that way. So with these trees, I know that if I do this, I'm going to force growth coming here. So that is that one done. So that's number three. Now this is another one with a lovely curly trunk. And Again, the wood is dying naturally. The way the wood has died, it's very nice and natural. So I will probably leave it. You see, I've also done a little bit of wiring because the branch was uh, shooting up too much, but I find that some of these branches have died. So let's take the wire off. The other thing which I've discovered with larches, I don't know why it only happens with larch, that if you put wire on the branch and leave it outside in the winter. The winter cold is transmitted to the wire and the wire transmits it to the branch or the trunk and it causes the branch to die. That's something I've noticed for the last 40 years, only with larch. That means if you leave wire on, it can cause the twigs or branch to die. I noticed that there was a dead twig there. Now this has become a bit one-sided. I want to, if I use the tree this way, I can wire that down a little more. Ideally I want something to grow that way so I can put a little bit of wire and produce the tree uh, with more balance, 
filling the space there. So that is another one done. So these, as I said to you, are all these very dumpy trees where I keep them just this size. I don't want them bigger than this. I will show you larger ones in a minute. So again here, I have one or two dead twigs. These dead twigs are typical of maples. And because this is already producing a nice canopy there, I don't want it to become too much of a fan shape, so I'm cutting it back to shape like that. And hopefully I'll get more of a head over there. And again, the top has died over there, and I can proceed to cut either with a saw to create a better a callus. Now this one I've got to be careful because the angle is awkward. I may need to nibble away with a, very carefully, nibble away with a branch cutter, but I'll just get Josh to cut that carefully. Certain trees have very hard wood. The Chinese elm, or all elms, have very hard wood. The other tree that ha has hard wood, I'll just turn the camera around, is the cornus. Look at these lovely flowers on the cornus. They're just about to bloom. Just about to bloom, these yellow flowers. And this cornus, or dogwood, is very hard. Someone told me one of our YouTube fans said that dogwood is um, just a, I think, different way of pronouncing dagwood. All you do is use for making tools, dag or dog. So that's why the wood is so hard. So, Josh has very skillfully pruned that off. My saws are getting blunt, so I have to change it. So the rest I will cut with a branch cutter. So that is the work we do on these trees. Now, looking at some of these trees, in the winter, you often get traces of insects or bugs which can be on the stems. If you look carefully, those little white bits are like insects, some sort of scale, so you've got to watch it very carefully. In Japan, they use the lime sulfur as a winter wash, a spray to kill the bugs. They still do it, but I think lime sulfur is too toxic a chemical to use for spraying, so I don't do that. Look at this one. I noticed that on this piece, there's a lot of that white, I think with a microscope or a magnifying glass, you'll see that they are insects. So what do I do? I use an ordinary, you know, bug killer. You can get this from any sort of garden center and just spray it on these branches and hopefully it will kill any dormant bugs that are there. Many of my eco friends tell me that you shouldn't use chemical, but I find that without chemical, it's very hard to get on top of all the bugs in the nursery. And there are others who also suggest using soapy water or washing up liquid. I don't think that works. I've tried for a long time, but I don't think that uh, little trick works with me. It may work with you, but I don't think it generally works. I think insecticide is, you know, more effective. So there you go. At least I'm not killing bees. There are no bees around, so I'm just killing these bugs. So let me now go to some of the other maples and show you what we're going to do with the other maples. So in this greenhouse, there are literally hundreds of maples, and they are all beginning to grow.
this is the time when I have to keep an eye on what I want these shoots to develop into. If I just look at this one, these are our homegrown trees. This is typical homegrown maple that we have grown in the field. And this has been grown for a taper. So this tree was cut over there. And you see that I put paste on it so it's callousing nicely. So the taper is developing very nice. And this has been grown long to create the taper. The reason why I haven't cut it back, and I'm still not going to cut it this year, is because the longer I leave it, this will thicken quicker, and I'll get a better taper. This will get thick, so it'll blend in with this part sooner than if I cut everything off now. See, I already cut one here. I cut there, cut there. But I'm now going to leave it to pull the sap up to make it thick. And maybe next year, if this becomes thick, I will then cut it back to there. So the maple is going to be this high. So this tree, I'm not going to leave. I've got to tell my staff not to cut it because some, some of them think that they're doing me a favor by uh, cutting it. But they don't realize what I'm leaving it for. Now, this trident maple, for instance, there's some long shoots. I'm leaving some of these long branches for either in-arching or whatever. And so not all the shoots are going to be cut on that one. So sometimes when you see long shoots, they are being left for a purpose. This is another of our homegrown trees. So now that one, that branch is doing nothing. That's stupid there, isn't it? I want more of a broom style. So that one I cut off because I don't want the energies to go that way. And because it's getting quite good ramification, I can afford to do this one now, because this will become quite a nice little broom style. So that one I've cut. Uh, what else is there? Now this is a tree that I'm growing on for making ramification. So you see that there's such a lot of twigs there, but because it's a mature tree, I can afford to prune some of these back. These were all produced, I think, in the latter part of the year. So just by constantly pruning it back to shape, I will increase the ramification. It's as simple as that. Just go around the tree, and prune it to the shape and keep doing it for the rest of the year and you will get a lot of ramification on that tree. Now, this is another case in point. These trees, oh look at it, growing in moss and in the gravel, the roots have come right through. So, Peter Chan's moss trick. Look at the roots that are coming through. And the roots are vigorous like this because I'm growing this tree in sphagnum moss. So I've done it deliberately to get more growth. So all this is sphagnum moss. I've not used soil. It's just growing in moss. So growing in moss creates a more a vigorous tree and you get a stronger tree. Last year I put a bit of wire on because I didn't want the branches to spring up too much. With maples, unfortunately, the wires do mark. I know that leaving the wire marks on pines and junipers gives it a gnarled look, but with maples, wire marks are not necessarily nice. So you've got to keep an eye on the wire marks on maples. So this tree I've been developing, you won't believe, for the last maybe 10 years. It was getting too tall, so I chopped it off there. I chopped it off there, took a side branch, and made this the new leader. So this is being restyled over the last 10 years, a long, long time. And this is going to be uh, the future tree. I know that it will take a long time, but I still have to decide on the possible front or the back hard to tell at this stage. I think I can take this branch down there and make it, but you can see the ramification at the top, how it's coming along. And there's some wire marks here because I wired this flat to get this branch going out this way. 
So this is how the tree is being developed. You see, I used a little bit of wire to flatten that one. And I will just keep pruning these back to get more ramification. This one I'll wire this way, and I'll develop this branch to make a new branch there. So this is how this tree is going to be developed. So every tree I've got to look at and see uh, what the pruning schedule would be for uh, each and every tree. Uh, let's look at this one. There's so many trees at random that we can pick out. Now this one is probably just an ordinary palmatum. And if that is the front, we don't want some of these. I want to regrow some of these branches. And because it's already getting good ramification, I don't need more. I may develop this one into a new leader. But these long shoots, I just go and keep pruning it back to the shape. So the more I prune, the more ramification I'm going to get. I'm leaving some of these so that it pulls the sap so I get a stronger central shoot there. This one I'll leave because I want that to become a strong branch. So that is what I would do with that one. Now, Arakawa, or the rough bark maple, a lot of people love that tree. I love it very much. But I find that with Arakawa, the leader invariably dies. Very hard to keep the leader alive when it's grown as a bonsai. So this one, I'm regrowing the top and I'm trying to restyle it so I've created new branches. So I don't want some of these long shoots to keep growing. So each year I let the long shoots grow and then I cut it back or prune it back to make it create more and more ramification. This is unusual because the leader has not been affected. It is growing quite well. So by doing this, I'm going to increase more side shoots. So you can see the structure of this tree coming along. I will now show you another Arakawa. I have several Arakawas. They are all being regrown. I may need to lift this out. And again, this is growing in moss because I want more growth. Growing it in moss stimulates the tree so I get more growth. So you can see how vigorous this tree is. The old leader unfortunately died. So this was the original leader. But the rest of the tree is quite strong. So this is a new leader growing. So I'm not going to cut this one off. It's going to be a nice, low-growing, spreading tree. And in nature, you get lots of trees like this. So, uh, let's take this to the bench to show you closer. What so, this is the Arakawa, you can see. It's quite a large tree. And with these low-spreading branches, it does remind me of quite a lot of these ancient oaks that we get in England. For those of you who haven't been to England, you'll know that some of these mighty oaks grow in these great big public parks and they have these beautiful shapes because they're all like three, four, six, seven, eight hundred years old. There's one oak in Lingfield which is about eight or nine hundred years old. Can you turn it upside down? And you can see growing in moss. Look at the roots on that. Growing in pure moss. Sphagnum moss. So moss may be expensive, but it's a lovely thing for uh, using to stimulate the growth of trees. So a lot of these stubby things which are dead, we can cut it off and clean it. Let me just look at the ramification on this. Now because I'm going to aim to produce uh, a low spreading tree, I don't want these branches to get too long. If I didn't prune it, they will get longer and longer. So lots of lovely ramification. I may 
grow the central shoot more to get a good leader but with this sort of growth there's no problem getting new branches to grow so these can be cut off these can be cut off now this leader which died you see I'm growing a new leader because the original top died these by the way I imported from Japan about 15 20 years ago but for some reason they, the leaders have a tendency to die they always have a tendency to die. I don't know why that is, but that is the nature of Arakawa. Certain trees behave in a certain way. Even that is in the way, I don't need that. So we're going to cut this. Now this one here, I'm going to get Josh to cut it. Many people when they make a cut, they like to make a sloping cut like that. I've found that over the years, if you make a sloping cut too soon, you may get die back there. That's why I left this, so that the new leader grows. So if you make a sloping cut and hope that you get a new shoot at that point, it won't happen. So even at this stage, I'm not going to get too close in case the top dies. So I'll just cut over there and let it die back gradually. And maybe next year, when this is stronger, I will then cut that back. So this is completely dead. These we can remove. So the future of the tree is going to be this way. And this is going to be a nice, low-spreading tree. I think it's got quite a nice base, too. And this, hopefully, will become a much stronger tree. So we will proceed to cut this. And go a little lower than that. Here. That was quite soft because it's rotten already, isn't it? I think you can probably go a little more. Can do another half inch. Still soft, still dead. That's doing nothing. I think we can cut a little more. So we're progressively cutting. Just do another quarter inch and see where we get. I think if we left it to nature, that would gradually fall off. It will rot away and fall off. You notice that whenever we use these saws, we always use a glove. Very dangerous to use saws without a glove, so be warned. Okay, I see it goes down to there. Goes down to there. We will nibble it with a branch cutter and see what happens. Or even use a root cutter. rotten so it's quite soft see this usually dies back to a point where the callousing will take place automatically so we don't have to worry too much so this basically is how we create taper as I said a lot of people who are not familiar with bonsai they all say oh why do you keep chopping the tree you know I'm afraid the only way to make taper is this way. So you'll die back to a point where it won't die anymore and the rest will take over. I don't want to press my luck, I'll only go as far as I need to. I think this one I may just let it rot away naturally. I won't even put paste on it. I won't take, cut it with paste. Arakawa has this lovely bark. And you notice that the bark 
gets that craggy surface only when the branch is old. See, these young bar pieces are already like four or five years old. They don't even bark yet. They don't get crusty, so they got to get really old to get crusty. This is an odd one. Hard to get it off. We use a branch cutter. The saw doesn't sit in there. how hard that is. So this is going to be a low spreading tree. So that is the shape. It's almost like a low growing broom. And that will be in, in a nice shallow oval pot would make it look nice. So we're keeping the front open. So this is the front of the tree. So I'm going to grow this for at least another two or three years and then cut it back and then create more ramification. So this is how this one is going to grow. So let me just look at one or two more so that you get a feel for what I'm doing with the maples. There are quite a few Arakawas here which have had their tops die. See, that's another one. The top has died. So we're growing this side shoot. This is another one, the top has died. So these were all imported about 10 or 15 years ago. And as they got older, they died. But they, I'm regrowing them to restyle it. So that's not the end of the world. So whenever you see things happening like that, don't panic. It is not the end of the world, as we say. Some of these are quite advanced trees, so there's a lot of lovely ramification. I don't need to do anything to them. We will just tip the extremities so that it creates even more ramification. Many of these are field-grown trees, like these were grown from very young in the field and then created into bonsai. Uh, like that one, that is one of our field-grown trees that's taken about 30 years to grow, complete with its own nibari, all created here. Uh, and if I can just show you here, although they are not Japanese maples, these are trident maples, these tried maples, you must be wondering why I'm leaving this very long shoot. It's because I want to create more taper and I'll probably cut it back to there. So that's why it's been left to grow like that. Maybe I can do it now <coughs> because it's had its uh, effect. I can now cut it there. So I've added two inches to that tree. So this is how we deal with most of these <laughs> maple sorry so that is a very thick branch so i'll cut it back very lightly and there are two leaders there one is going that way one is going that way i don't want both of them so let's take this one out and so this is going back like that so the tape is not bad so i'll cut it there and that's the future direction of that tree so you can see how long-winded the process is. Uh, this is another large example of one of my specimens. I like making big trees, despite what some of these Japanese growers think. Now this tree is almost like 1.2 meter at least, maybe 1.3 meter tall. It's a twin trunk and I'm growing it tall and I keep tipping it to create the ramification. 
See, look at that. Look at all those shoots there. Now that's a strong branch. This is going to strengthen that branch. I can probably wire that down, but I don't need that bit. So I cut that off. And then I will wire that flat like this. By the way, at this time of the year, if you cut maples, they will bleed. Bleed meaning that they will uh, create a lot of sap or like water running through the twigs. Those of our Swedish friends who are watching will know that with silver birch, at this time of the year when you cut the branches of silver birch, you get a sap and they make wine out of that sap or you can just drink the water. Same with the maples, you know, there's a sap rising that uh, is a natural process. The tree is starting to pump the liquids up into the stems to create new growth. And don't worry about the bleeding. It will bleed for a couple of days and then naturally stop. So if you see lots of water coming out of the twigs of maples when you've pruned it in the very early spring, that's all part of the normal process. So these are all different maples, as I say, in different stages of training. This again is typical of the field grown trees. We grow them in the field and then we chop it, let it rot. And this is going to be like a twin trunk tree. So that's how it's going to develop. So we know exactly what we're going to do with these, although it may not be apparent to you. Even these ones were air layerings from the big Benichidoris. And occasionally you'll see a very thick piece of wire, like this one, for instance. You will see on that one, I've used a fairly thick wire to take the branch down. Because if you didn't do that, the tree will start producing vertical branches, like this one even. I did it. I've got to do it again to get it flat. To get these branches going flat, they were wired. Can you see the wire marks there? It's grown out. Even these were wired to get it to grow flat. So you've got to use wire to get that effect. So I'm filling that space. Uh, so this is going to be a nice tree. Lovely Nibari there. Again, one of our field grown trees. Because I've been here for 35 or 36 years, all these are the fruits of 30 or more years of growing. Uh, so you keep seeing more and more. There's another field grown tree grown in a flower pot. That's the first stage of training. A bit of wire there. And if I don't want it too long, I cut that back, get it in a broom shape, encourage this leader to grow thick, get a better taper. And this one you can see, I didn't put any cut base. And I cut it horizontal rather than a sloping cut. And it will die back naturally to that sloping area and as it dies the wood will rot away naturally so I didn't use any cut paste on that one. So it just shows you don't always have to use cut paste on, on some of these trees. This by the way is air layering. I hate to keep flitting from one subject to another. These were this was air layered last year. Look at that. Look at the roots on that. Air layering horn beam. So this will be potted up. I'll take it out and pot it up and then we select the branches. So just to show you what we do with air layerings. Uh, these are the maple seedlings that we have. Look at that. This is a three-year-old seedling, tall as me, nearly two meters, see? So if I want to make this a big strong tree, I will just keep letting it grow without any pruning so that it pulls the sap up and makes the trunk thicker. There are other trees I will show you and that is the air layering I did last year. You saw the YouTube video on that one, so you'll be seeing that. This was an air layering from two years ago, De Shoujo, twin trunk. So this is not yet showing signs of growth, but it will soon show signs of growth. Now, these are quite interesting projects here. My goodness, I put that gravel down only in autumn and already the roots have gone through. Now what am I doing here? They're all like this. You notice that these S-shaped maples, look at them, they're all, I've got several of them and they're all literally like clones. Look at that, all this growth, about 1.2 meter in the last year. So you can get lots of results very quickly and the whole object of 
letting it grow is that I'm pulling the taper up. So that's how it's grown. I think it's grown enough. I will cut that off. And then, because I've added the height, it was only this high, about 30 centimeter. I added another 20 centimeter. So I now have a 50 centimeter tall tree. So from here on, I will just keep it to that height and let this thicken. These lower branches will thicken the base of the trunk. So I've added another 20 centimeters in just one year. So this is another tree. This is a rather tricky one because it's got like a leader there, a leader there. So what do I choose? I can choose this one. So let's take this off. Sometimes you've got to take a quick decision. Take that off, take that off. But they grow so fast that you can change the shape within a year. Another one, this is how I've got to do a look at all those shoots. So this is an inward growing branch I don't want. If there are too many branches, like here, there are two there. Why will I want that one? I'll keep just one of them. If you have too many branches there, remember you create inverse taper. So you've got to watch that. Too many twigs will cause the effect called inverse taper. And this also is a very strong branch growing that way. If you don't watch it, this can become a new leader. So I will take out this vigorous one and keep the weaker one. Now this one is also creating a new leader here. You see how strong it is? I should take that off, otherwise it'll take over the tree and you'll lose the taper that you're trying to create. So this is growing up that way. I don't need to grow it bigger than that. This is as big as I want the tree to be and the rest is going to be thickening the branch. So we've got to look at all these trees. There are about a, uh, 10 or 20 of these. So that's how that's been growing. And I will show you some trees which are what we call a bit of a problem. These are our field grown trees and I cut the top off last year, although I made a straight cut. Part of it died, so that's growing. But no matter, I can make this the new leader. This will become the new leader. I can cut that off and forget all these side shoots. And then I've got a maple that thick and then create the shape from there. So it may seem a long process, but that is how it is actually done. Uh, what else can I show you while I'm here? Every tree, every situation is different. This, believe it or not, was an air layering I did years ago. That's why it's so dumpy. And it's going to be grown as a dumpy tree. And I will just keep trimming it to keep it a short dumpy tree. And because you could air layer thick branches, very little root. So this is growing well. Let's just take you for a walk. All these are maples that we have pulled out from our field. They're grown in the field and put in pots. So these are going to be further refined, get more branches. And that's how we make our maples. So as I say, we are self-sufficient in maples. Virtually all the maples, bar the very old ones, are created here. They're all created here. Uh, even these were big field-grown trees that we dug up on the way to becoming bonsai. The rest of these are our specimen trees. Many of the trees I'm changing the shape, like this great big maple. This is a big mountain maple, so I cut the top off because it was too tall. That was almost six foot, two meter tall, so I cut it down to about a meter. So a new branch is being pulled up to make the leader. So that's what's being done to that one. Uh, i just show you the flowers of the cornice mass while we're passing. Look at it, beautiful. While I'm passing by, 
I will just show you some of the projects we did last year. This is the famous tanuki juniper. See how strong it is. I'm going to do a separate video showing the results of all the past experiments during the past year. This is another tanuki that I did last year. See how strong they are. This only done like nine months ago. So everything, ah, this is the one that I split with a cleaver. You remember the one I used with an ax and I split the tree? I'll show you the other part. This is the other part. This is the small part. And already the buds are coming. And it might even flower. So this is going to be a cute little bonsai. I promised this to someone from Sweden and she will get it. So this is the tree that we split with the ax and look at it. It's got flower buds. I will film it when the flowers come. If you take close uh, pick there, those are flower buds. So the literati with their great big ax has survived well. So all our projects survive. So I hope you've enjoyed this little tour. There are more maples everywhere. Those have got good ramifications, so we continue to ramify them. I think we showed some of these projects. There's a mighty twin trunk, which was originally a five or four trunk, but I decided to make it a twin trunk. So I hope you've learned something from this maple exercise in mid-February.